Hey everyone, Charlie here from the Atomic Age and I have some exciting news to share from about a month ago. The nuclear reactor starter company Kairos Power got construction approval for their new reactor. This is the first generation 4 reactor to be approved for construction in the United States. So it's their generation 4 Molten fluoride salt cooled graphite moderated triso fuel pebble test reactor. Nuclear loves their three letter abbreviation, so this is also known as the FHR or fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactor. So, this is not, in fact, a this is not a, a commercial reactor that will generate power for people. This is the first step in getting to that point, and this is a test reactor where they'll uh, you know learn how to build the reactor and how to operate it and get some valuable data that they can apply to their final design. This reactor will be built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is where a lot of this new advanced reactor tech is happening. Of course, derives from the Manhattan Project sites that were based in Oak Ridge. But enough of that, let's get into what every single aspect of this reactor design actually entails because a lot of it is very, very different. Not a lot of it, pretty much all of it. It's very different than uh, any nuclear reactor approved for construction and built in the United States prior to this point. Commercial reactors, of course, uh, with one exception, which we'll get into uh, later in this video, but let's get started with it. So this is a so-called Generation 4 reactor. I'm not the biggest fan of this naming convention. Let's go through what the generations mean. It all starts with so-called Generation 1 reactors. These were all test reactors, prototype reactors built in the 50s and 60s in the United States. Uh, none of these exist anymore today. Generation 2 reactors form the vast majority of reactors in the United States and both in the world. I asked this in a poll on my channel recently and uh, it was almost a 50-50 a split between people thinking Generation 2 and Generation 3, 3 plus reactors are the most abundant in the world, but notice still Generation 2 reactors. These were all built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s primarily, uh, and this constitutes the most of the reactors in Japan, Russia, France, UK, America. That is when most of the reactors were built. Generation 3 and 3 plus reactors have started in like the 90s, and a few of these has been, have been built. Generation 3, Generation 3 plus reactors are iterations on these designs that feature, you know, more efficiency. Uh, modular designs, uh, Generation 3 Plus reactors feature uh, fully passive uh, meltdown protection, fully passive cooling in the case of an accident, which is a very nice feature to have. The new reactors that just went online at Plant Vogel in the US are Westinghouse AP1000 reactors, and the AP stands for Advanced Passive. So these are reactors that can be fully passively cooled in the event of an accident. You don't need generators. Generation 4 are these new reactors that we're, we're talking about now, so like molten fluoride salt cooled, triso pebble fueled, uh, graphite moderation, non water moderation, non water coolants, small module reactors. Uh, this is uh, what we're now calling Generation 4. And the reason I'm not the biggest fan of this naming convention is because it makes it sound like all these reactor concepts are brand new. But all this was thought of in the 50s already. Uh, molten fluoride salt coolants, liquid metal coolants, gas coolants, graphite moderation, triso pebbles, which we'll get into. All right, so that's like a, a very brief overview of where we got to generation four reactors today, including this Kairos power test reactor, which is called a Hermes. These new advanced reactors are going to be fueled with uh, what is called HALU, which is high assay, low enriched uranium. Uh, and this is just a fancy way to say uranium, uranium enriched up to 20%. And uh, all else equal, this gets you a smaller reactor. Uh, fuel can stay in the reactor for longer. So although all these reactors will be using uranium as fuel, fuel is not in the form of fuel pellets. So all US power reactors now have fuel pellets, just tiny little cylinders of uranium dioxide fuel in long fuel rods, and you have a bunch of fuel rods in a reactor. Uh, some of these uh, generation four reactors use what is called uh, triso fuel. So TRISO stands for tristructural isotropic, bit of a mouthful, but one TRISO particle is about the size of a poppy seed. You have a little uranium kernel right in the center and it's surrounded by four layers of carbon and silicon. 
And these four layers form containment. So in the traditional US power reactor with fuel pellets and a fuel rod, that metal fuel rod sheath cladding is the primary containment for the fuel. In these triso pebbles, it's these layers of tiny little layers of carbon and silicon around each triso kernel, uh, around each uranium kernel rather, that forms the triso particle and that is primary containment for the fuel. In the Hermes reactor, Hermes test reactor, these triso, it won't just be, you know, like triso particles just like poured into reactor. They are thousands of triso particles are pressed into billiard ball sized graphite spheres. So they're embedded in a graphite matrix. So a much more, if you're not used to it, it, it seems very radical compared to uh, a uranium fuel rod. And this has, uh, you know, several advantages. These pebbles are very robust. These particles are very robust. Uh, you know, carbon and silicon are some of the highest melting points of any known material. So these uh, triso pebbles and triso particles, uh, in many, if not all, the reactors they're being designed for are actually meltdown proof. They cannot melt in an accident because the reactor is designed in such a way that they will not get that hot in an accident. So yes, graphite. These are graphite moderated reactors. The tips are made of graphite, which accelerates reactivity. Now, some of you may be thinking about Chernobyl here in graphite. What I'll say about that is that Chernobyl blew up because it was a bad design, not because it used graphite as a moderator. Graphite's just one of several materials that you can use as a moderator. And in addition to Chernobyl being a bad reactor design, the Soviet Union at the time had a bad nuclear safety culture that was not set up to catch this accident from happening, because Chernobyl was entirely preventable. But anyway, this isn't a video about Chernobyl, so let's get back to the Hermes reactor. Uh, let's briefly go over what moderation is. So you get a chain reaction in a reactor by splitting fissile uranium atoms. Uh, when you split these atoms, they give off neutrons, and these neutrons are going very, very fast. In fact, we call them fast neutrons. It is hard to split fissile uranium atoms with fast neutrons, so we use what is called a moderator to slow down fast neutrons to thermal, or you can also call them slow, neutrons. So a moderator is similar to brakes on a car. Uh, it's easier to handle a car at low speeds than it is at high speeds. It's a similar way to think about it. So all U.S. power generating reactors, in fact the vast majority of them in the world, all use moderation. However, they all, most of them all really use water as a moderator because water is a liquid. It also serves as your coolant, so it also takes the heat away from the reactor, so it's a two-in-one solution. The problem with water, though, is that it has a tendency to boil at pretty low temperatures. Uh, temperatures lower than you would get in a reactor, so you have to run the water through very thick piping so you can run it at high pressures. So you need the thick piping to withhold that really high pressure, and that, uh, that means cost, that means expense. It's really expensive to make all those heavy structures and to support them and to analyze for them. So a benefit of graphite moderation is that you don't need to use water as a moderator or a coolant, so you don't need all that heavy, thick reactor structures and piping to support water at super high temperatures and pressures. So that's a way to make your reactor a lot cheaper and easier to build. One advantage to a water-moderated reactor, however, is that if there's a leak, a loss of coolant accident, uh, if the water goes away, the chain reaction goes away. So reactors that have a moderator cannot go critical, they cannot have a chain reaction. Uh, go critical means chain reaction. Go critical is not not really a bad thing when it comes to a reactor, generally speaking. If the, wa if the water goes away, the reactor cannot have a chain reaction. But you have to find a new way to cool the fuel at that point, because you have to prevent a meltdown, but uh, there will be no runaway chain reaction at that point. With the graphite, the moderator is always going to be there, even in an accident, because the fuel is fused to this graphite. It's not inherently a bad thing, it's just something you need to uh, design for, and they have in fact designed for it with these meltdown-proof triso compacts. The reactor pretty much just kind of runs, it can just run rampant, and as it gets hot, the reaction comes down and it self-controls itself and it keeps itself from getting too hot and melting. That's just a feature of, uh, chain, of uranium chain reactions. They, they self-limit as they get too hot. All right, so we've talked fuel, we've talked moderator. Now let's talk coolant. So since we have graphite 
as a moderator, we need something else as a coolant because graphite is not liquid. <laughs> so this reactor is cooled by what is called FLEEB. <laughs> this reactor is cooled by what is called FLEEB. It is a fluoride lithium beryllium salt. So this is not in fact a liquid metal cooled reactor, this is a molten salt reactor. In principle, this is similar to table salt, which is sodium chloride, but uh, you know, it's just different elements comprise uh, FLEEB. In theory, you could use table salt as a coolant, molten table salt as a coolant for a reactor. You could also use uh, liquid sodium, because sodium is a metal when it's not combined with chlorine to make table salt. Just a, a bit of a difference there with, uh, with that. So molten salt and, and liquid metal coolants are two different things. This is not the first time that FLEEB has been considered or even used. Uh, back in the 50s or 60s, there was something called the Molten Salt Reactor Experiment. In that reactor, the uranium is dissolved into the coolant because FLEEB is also a moderator. The fluoride, lithium, and beryllium all provide some amount of moderation, uh, enough to, to get a reactor going, in fact but the graphite is the moderator in this reactor. FLEEB is just the coolant. So again, because FLEEB is not water, it does not boil at very low temperatures. At very high temperatures before FLEEB will boil, higher than the reactor operates at. So you can have the thin piping and structures. You don't need all that heavy piping and structures like with a water reactor. So again, the graphite and the FLEEB work together to you know, give you that cheaper, more cost, let's, let's say cost, let's say affordable reactor structures, just cheap as has a, a connotation, uh, much, much thinner reactor structures. And in addition to that, because the fleet can get a lot hotter without boiling, you can make your reactor a lot more efficient. The hotter you can get the coolant, the more efficient your reactor, and water is limited in that regard. So water reactors have efficiencies around 30%, this Kairos Power Graphite Moderated Triso molten salt reactor has an efficiency more around 45%, so that's a big, that's a big gain. I mentioned earlier that, you know, a lot of these concepts have already been thought of, and uh, TRISO is also among that, TRISO particles. Uh, you know, that was initially thought of back in the 50s and 60s, and in fact there was actually a TRISO particle reactor that operated in the U.S. for a brief amount of time in the 70s and 80s. It was called Fort St. Vrain, but it was uh, plagued with operating issues. A lot of the lessons learned from that have been applied to this new round of TRISO research and development. So there you go guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope this cleared up some of the air around this reactor and what makes it so unique and special. Uh, they got construction permit. They still need to get a permit for operations. Uh, that'll come with time, but uh, you know, definitely an exciting time. Definitely. Definitely cool to see this. I didn't know that this was uh, you know, coming down the pipeline and it was uh, a pleasant surprise to see that day that you know, one of these new reactors has gotten a construction permit. So definitely cool stuff. Definitely head headway is being made. I remain optimistic, but uh, yeah, that's a topic for another day, whether or not this will come to fruition. But good news for now and uh, hope you guys enjoy. See you guys next time and have a good one.